I kind of would like to share with you some ideas about the ecosystem development in general, you know, about how you can take super different people together, align them under some vision, you know, do some great stuff, and uh, how to build capacity, how to resolve conflicts, how uh, deal with the con like crises, and try to show it in the few case studies. So uh, when I just joined, you know, like what 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 did I see? Uh, initially, I was mostly working in the development, so I was like specifically following my narrow field. But when I started to look at the like country in general, I learned that first of all, Ukraine has one of the best adoption rates, and for specific reasons. Like, uh, we don't have a securities market, and people don't trust banks, and so on. But uh, in the same way, like, the current situation, as in many countries, is quite, like, gray zone, you know? And uh, the, since uh, 2012 or 14, there were, like, a bunch of tries to uh, propose some kind of le legislation or something that would guide this industry, but all of them failed, basically, before this. Uh, like a new president came, like Zelensky, and he had this vision of a uh, country in a smartphone, you know, government with a smartphone, and uh, they created this ministry, which consisted mostly of the business people, you know, and young people, which <laughs> was contrasting a lot with the other, other ministries and bodies. So I started to work there, and what I learned is, like, basically we can propose something, but in order to pass anything, you know, we need a general consensus. And at that time, you know, now it's getting much better, but at that time, most people knew crypto for money laundering, uh, like drugs and uh, hacks and stuff like that. So it was like we needed to come and speak to everybody and explain this is only a small percent of it. You know, like dollar is also like <laughs> used for the same purposes. It doesn't mean we need to ban it. So uh, in order to like make this uh, happen, you know, I saw some specific like problems or challenges. First of all, every uh, ministry, everybody or every business, they had their own agenda, you know, they saw what they want to do, you know, like the national bank just sees the currency aspect of it, right? And uh, like, or like somebody is just looking at the exchange market or the mining market, but not all of that together, you know, there was no specific vision of how that all will strive. And uh, also another part is like the businesses and the like Web3 crowd is mostly like crypto anarchic and they hate government. They don't want to even touch it. And I feel it <laughs> the same. But uh, also like there was no productive dialogue, you know, like no attempts to, to build this connection. And also most of the like this holy wars, you know, about like somebody wants to do something in a position and all that fighting happened inside of Ukraine. Nobody thought, wow, this is like a global like movement, you know, how do we become competitive like worldwide or how do we think about it as like not just inside but, but as general. And uh, the final, <laughs> final problem was that it was, that was a middle of the bear market. So it was really hard to find any resources to develop it. But even like to illustrate it on the case, even like with a project that really got funding, you know, like most of them didn't, but there was this project that the ministry was developing, like it passed the law on the what is virtual assets, basically crypto, you know, like what is the key, what is the wallet, stuff like that. And uh, there was a norm that uh, all of the service providers need to be in some kind of register. So we should have some exchanges or brokers, like their license is registered somewhere. And we got this task and this funding from the uh, Swiss Embassy, yeah, please develop. It's a nice stuff, you know, like develop this registry. I got super experienced, the consultants, they proposed us with three options. So one is like fully public system, probably on Ethereum, but maybe something EVM, whatever. But uh, then hybrid solution, you know, semi-closed and centralized. And they did a comparison, a balance scorecard, you know, like on the security, cost of support, the anti like uh, corruption effect and stuff like that and all together like the ethereum solution the public solution was winning you know and it was like they said like we propose this solution and i was like yes let's do that but we needed to consult with other stakeholders and the donors who sponsor that like we asked them what what do they think and they said well 
we would, you would probably have 200 companies. Do you really need blockchain for this? You know, and uh, then we talked to the businesses like, hey guys, what do you think we should build? And they said, could you just do no registration at all, or we will take our business elsewhere, you know, to other jurisdictions. <laughs> we don't want to be registered at all, you know. And uh, the final like kill <laughs> of this idea was from the lawyers. They said, well, potentially we could use the blockchain here, but due to the uh, current uh, laws, uh, all the information should be stored on the ser servers in the country. So if you would like to do that, you need to change this. And that can be like a five-year project, you know, compared to the small case of all, like we wanted to do in a half year. So guess which solution we preferred. And that's like the illustration <laughs> for <laughs> what, what I have to deal with. So uh, that's what led me to think more about the vision, you know, how do we create, like, even, of course, I, I see the point, like, it doesn't make sense to do a 200 people register or company register on the blockchain, but it's just a start, you know, somebody needs to do this change in the norm, somebody needs to start building different services and information, it's kind of op open ecosystem and stuff like that, but nobody stated that as a task, you know, we just solve this small solution here and there. So... I was uh, in the search for the vision, and one of my friends from the UNDP Acceleration Lab, he recommended to use the foresight. And basically the foresight is the, like it's a research method, it's the community development approach. It's like really hard to t tell in just few words, but what it isn't for sure, it's not a prediction. You know, it's not about like, okay, last year we earned $1 million, so next year maybe it's $2 million. It's uh, rather about the different trends that can occur and how like they can play out together, you know, what happens if all of them materialize or none of them materialize, what then would happen, who will win, and so on. So, uh, one of the key uh, ideas is that it should be like systematic and participatory. So for that, we took each of a kind, we took uh, representatives from every ministry, you know, from national bank to cyber police, we took parliamentaries, every kind of business, uh, social, uh, NGOs, uh, economists, I would even like ecologists, you know, because that was also one of the insights there. And uh, we got them together in a set of like offline events and Zoom calls to speak about what do they see, what trends do they see, what future or like what needs do they have. And uh, the second aspect of it is like we gathered all of that intelligence about the future for our long term vision process. So we said like it's not for a year, it's like 2030, you know, 10 years. For many people in the ministry planning for 10 years it was like, can't do. But uh, we strive for that. And uh, the two key trends that we identified was like first of all the asset tokenization, you know, whether it would grow or not, and the uh, control over personality. And in the, our audience, nobody believed that it won't grow. Everybody believed it would grow, you know? So we didn't even consider those scenarios. But where the real fight happened is in the between this uh, personality control. So mostly people spoke about, on the one hand, the values of the security, you know, protection of like customers, consumers, and so on. But on the other hand, it's like freedom, you know? no. Protection, like we can lose our like uh, freedom, but that doesn't mean that we'll ha ha gain protection for sure, you know. So uh, at one moment we just stand it on the line, you know, from the like security to freedom, and people stated some arguments, and other could you know change their place at, at this, and we ended up, you know, like somewhere in the middle, but closer to the freedom. And the scenario, what the metaphor for this scenario, we call it digital Venice, in the way of like golden age of trade you know, open trade and uh, prosperity, lots of bridges between all of these systems and so on, in comparison to digital dictatorship, you know, where mass surveillance, of course, some maybe big enterprises can win, you know, but for the innovation, for the consumers and so on, it doesn't prove to be the best. So this was our, like, choice there. And uh, after that, what initially happened is people started to, like, they saw all of that community gathered around those ideas and they started to propose different projects. You know, we started to see like, who's gonna need to do what, you know? What governments needs to do, what business needs to do. You know, that set up the initial roadmap of our operations where people really proposed something, what they wanted. And uh, by the end of like this six months extensive work, I was super happy. 
You know, like uh, I saw all of the stakeholders, we established all these contacts, we had this developmental vision, we had this roadmap, 70 pages report, extensive, you know, education happened through this, you know, people discussed, you know, like in national about what is DeFi, what is NFT and stuff like that. But one of the key ideas is that people build trust. You know, I heard somebody telling like from the business, oh, this guy from the uh, financial monitoring, he's like adequate and nice, you know, we can probably speak to him. And uh, government also, like our mental workers, they had like, okay, this founders, entrepreneurs, they're like, okay, they, they do some nice stuff. So it created the initial basis for like human relations in this process. And we also established a project office, you know, with all these experts, 11 working groups, some of them already got funding for education and infrastructure. And I was like on the high moment of it <laughs> at that time. And what you could think is what can go wrong, you know, after that. Well, uh, on uh, February 24th, the day that most of Ukrainians will remember for long, you know, the war started. And uh, now after eight months, it's kind of like a new normality, you can say. But at the first months, I felt like, would I really like, would I have to speak to, like speaking to my close one, would I have a chance to speak to them tomorrow? I wasn't sure. And all of this nice development and plans, they were also doomed, you know, <laughs> who will think about this innovation at this time. So, this is also like I recognized the moment we recognized in our team that we can't also lower hands, you know, this time required us to act and to do something. And uh, what was promising really is that on the base of the initial trust that people, you know, talking together, a bunch of projects emerged that started to, you know, collect funding. And uh, one of such projects is called Aid for Ukraine. It was uh, under the Ministry of Digital Transformation brand and uh, supported by a few businesses, you know, so government accepted crypto and sent it to the different purchases. The key idea there was that the supply chain requirements were super high. If uh, there would need, there would be need in like quadrocopter or, you know, a car, you would need it tomorrow, you know, so you don't have time to do this bureaucratic procedures or whatever. So it's speeding up the processes a lot and the transparency of it. And, uh, yeah, uh, that was one of the biggest one, which collected around $60 million from 50,000 people. And you could see that Ethereum uh, ecosystem played a big role, as well as like people donated just around $300, but guys like Vitalik Buterin, like in millions and so on. So feel free to check it out. And uh, the other uh, like projects uh, were initiated by a set of like business owners. They said like, under our reputation, we collect these funds, which is like important at the time, many people, like not only good actors activated, but bad actors activated, where they collected it like kind of for Ukraine, you know, but could, you know, just take this money. So the brand of ministry or the brand of like business owners and so on was really important for that. And like Unchained Fund, they had this multi-seek, you know, they like, we didn't have the time to build a full scale, you know, DAO for everything, but we tried to keep the closest to that. And you can see that the money was sent like for different causes. We need to like be lean and agile. There was many uh, grassroots, uh, you know, initiatives that needed just small amounts of funds. So there was like this people struggling in the other countries migration that they had no money to survive, you know, and uh, they can't even always use their money for some reason. So uh, this help cards so direct given was also major thing. And finally, NFTs, NFTs became like a real thing. Uh, Ukraine DAO, like one of the major, they collected like more than six millions and they decided to distribute those funds across the uh, like trusted NGOs. Cause like from the external view, you don't know like who to donate to, you know, like we don't respect too much guys like Red Cross or somebody cause they don't go this last mile to, to the real, you know, like workplace and to help those people. So the, the like and for external, they don't know where to give. So they kind of created this uh, connection or the Museum of War, which uh, connected both the aspect of like creativity to, to the fundraising for the ministry. We even got this CryptoPunk we sold for 100K. So first of all, I would like to thank you a lot for as a community, for everybody who supported it, who donated, who tracked, 
who uh, was uh, with us in this hard moment. After this, you know, nobody can say in Ukraine that you know, crypto is like non-desirable or something. So, yeah, just just for this moment, thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Oh, it's not all. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Do I have time? Yeah, I have some time. I'm finishing, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what I propose to, like, what we can do next is, like, uh, like let's keep hacking, you know? Like, currently, the, uh, like, we, we got bombed all the time, you know? Now they, like, aiming at the... Uh, like electrical and like water infrastructure and so on, but that doesn't stop people from like coding and doing their work. You know, they work like in the underground or whatever. They keep hacking. Just recently, there was like a hackathon in Kiev where Vitalik was, and uh, people were like thinking about the solution that can be just like now we need it in Ukraine, but tomorrow, you know, who knows which country? Already, like if you look at the security aspect of the DLT, like in. Georgia or Taiwan, they already are thinking about the cyber attacks that can happen. In, in our country, it's also like quite a big problem. And uh, it's also a bunch of migration challenges because, of course, like national banks, they try to like secure macro situation, you know, but also people can't always, you know, transfer money or like uh, open a bank account. And uh, in our vision, we're looking to, to move uh, all of this ownership right system to these trusted ecosystems. And just like as a final note, what, what I learned through all of this experience, you know, what I hope you can use in your work as well, is that uh, without the vision, you know, that won't work, you know, we will be still uh, disconnected in what we do. And uh, what we achieved is like the sense of the shared future and the community who was like experiencing this shared future is like in the war, we all became kind of dull, like everybody started to work despite any conflicts. And second is that, uh, well, while uh, technology can be neutral in a way, you know, like, but uh, with the same technology, you can use, you can build either uh, dictatorship or like uh, Venice, whatever, like democracy. So, and for that, there should be a demand, for, like understanding from the people. Like currently, it's just you know, few percent, one percent. You know, we need more people to really kind of requested from the politicians and politicians that they move it. It's kind of a long process, but without this like win-win interaction and consent, consensus, it just won't happen. And uh, in our approach, we saw that raising awareness and education was key. You know, people just, if, uh, if they don't get it, they don't trust it. So currently we're launching a program to get like by 2030, more than a half of Ukrainians crypto literate. And we're now educating governmental workers how to use MetaMask and stuff like that. So they will have practical skills, they will see it. So that would really help us in the, like, or everybody help in the crisis. So people will already rely and know that. So on that note, uh, thank you again. Let's connect. You have an ally in the Ukrainian government <laughs> in me. If you want to do something together, please find me or connect. I will be really happy to help. Thank you.